Ready? Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for showing up, which uh, I'm sure could be probably in the middle of the night for some of you. Uh, I, I know that most people who've been traveling just got here, so we appreciate uh, you attending today. Uh, also, we got started a little bit late because we're told there's like a 25 person queue uh, to get into uh, the facility here, but we've decided to go ahead and get started and uh, we will uh, end on time. But if there's a few people that uh, have questions or other comments, uh, we'll, we'll stick around for a few minutes before they clear the room for the next, the next section. So uh, welcome very much to today's uh, session on the Innovation Playbook. And uh, I will tell you, we're going to have a very fun and exciting and interactive time. So make sure that you uh, keep your thinking cap on, that you stay engaged, because we will be uh, doing some questions and answers with you as the audience. And I do uh, really want to say thank you to our top tier A team panelists, uh, who I will introduce uh, in a minute. But we're very fortunate to have them guide us along on this journey today. So the question that we really have on the table, the key question is how do innovative businesses maintain their edge? And I tell you, I can't think of a better, more appropriate time to discuss this topic. Let me give some context. A recent CEO survey said that nearly 80% of the respondents, these are CEOs responding, believe innovation will create significant new revenue and cost reduction opportunities over the next three years. My interpretation is that, to me, that translates into multiple disruptive innovation opportunities. Factoid two, economists, I mean, they never really agree anyway, but right now, more than ever, around the world, they're in a heated debate on whether new innovation over the next five to 10 years has the potential to move us from the faltering productivity of growth rates of less than 1% during the period of about the last 15 years to rates over 3% during pre-1970, when out of all things, we invented things like airplanes, cars, washing machines, indoor plumbing. And let's not forget those never-ending optimists who claim that exponential technologies, 3D printing, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, infinite computing, robotics, are going to make an unprecedented impact on things that really matter to business and society. And lastly, there's that phrase called the innovator's curse. We've all heard it. Exceptional, innovative, and successful companies that somehow just fade away. So for one reason, they just weren't able to keep their competitive edge. So what went wrong other than the inability to not repeat success? Was there no self-will to self-disrupt? Was there no tone at the top for the survival type importance of relentless innovation? So let's find out. And uh, the secrets of this so-called innovation playbook, I'm going to introduce our panel. And as I do so, I'd like to remind you that we do have simultaneous uh, translation in English, Mandarin, Japanese. And uh, the headphones were uh, in the back when you walked in if, if you forgot them. So uh, let me start with, with Christy on my left. Uh, Christy Wyatt is chairman and CEO of Good Technology, one of the world's most foremost providers of security mobility solutions. She has over 15 years of executive management. It's a fabulous company. I encourage you to go to her website, Good Technology. I've got uh, Christophe Chazot. Uh, next uh, is HSBC's head of innovation and leads the teams responsible for strategic innovation investment. He has more than 20 years of experience in all asset classes around capital markets. Who's next? Uh, we have Ahmed al uh, is uh, Saudi Aramco's chief technology officer. Saudi Aramco, I know that most of you know this, is the world's largest crude oil exporter, producing roughly one in eight barrels of the world's oil supply. He's been with Saudi Aramco for more than 30 years in the area of technology. And we've got uh, Jacob Sue is the CEO of Symbio, a leading innovator of software product co-creation solutions. He was named one of the world's top 12 young global leaders of tomorrow 
by Chief Executive Officer in 08, and he also serves as the forum's young global leaders. So uh, I'm going to engage you right away. So if uh, you're not paying attention, I'm going to call on you. So what I want to do is we're going to do a three-minute uh, icebreaker to get you engaged with the panelists and get us engaged with each other. And I'm going to ask you one question, and what I want is a one-sentence answer. The question is, how do innovative businesses maintain their edge? How do innovative businesses maintain their edge? Now, I see some very familiar faces in the audience. I know that many of you like to talk uh, and give speeches and stories. But the discipline is I want a one-sentence answer, your thought, how do innovative businesses maintain their edge? Somebody want to raise their hand? Um, they have to learn how to learn all the time. It's not learning something. Learn how to learn. Oh, Tom, I like that. One other uh, couple more. Raise your hand if you got a one-sentence answer to how do companies maintain their competitive edge? Uh, I believe it's through understanding your customers better than your competition. Certainly, there's got to be the customers in there. Is one place, please? Collaboration. Okay, more collaboration across, 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 across industries and cross functions. Got to, got, to, got to wake up. Oh, here we go. Challenge existing business model. Challenge the existing business model. I like that. A couple more. Got one up here. Keep track of errors. Keep track of? Errors. Ed okay. Ed okay, got that. Here we go. Thank you. Create a culture where curiosity and experimentation is the norm. I like that. A couple more? Right here. I assume that's through the government investment in the innovation. Okay. How do businesses maintain their competitive edge? around innovation. One last one. Somebody can give me a good one. Or a mediocre one. Oh, we've got one back here. Where were you? Here you are. Never be content. That's for sure. I agree with that. Anyone else? OK, thank you. I think we need to convert the innovations into the result of the business. Perfect. OK. Invest in, in uh, innovation. Invest in innovation. OK. Be courageous and don't fear failure. I like that one, that's for sure. OK, good. I think we've got a couple good ones here. Doing great. Take that back. Well, thank you very much for getting this going. I appreciate that. Um, the way this is going to work, I'm going to go to the panel now uh, and go through a set of questions. Uh, probably maybe only one or two questions each, and then I'm going to come back to you uh, halfway through uh, and ask you for your other questions that you might have for the panelists because you might have better questions than I can think of, and so we want to keep this interactive. But for the next few minutes, I'm going to engage with the uh, panelists. And I'm going to go to Christoph first. Um, I read um, in an article that HSP last year allocated up to 200 million for investments in tech startups. Now, we're seeing a lot of big FG500s creating investment pools to acquire small startups. So in the case of SBC, are you looking to change your business model? Are you looking to uh, uh, buy an idea, if you will, or invest in some uncertainty that you're hoping that one of these uh, Moonstruck opportunities actually builds up? Tell us how, how this investment vehicle works and how it's changing the, the mindset at HSBC. The, uh, the objective of this uh, allocation <coughs> is really to create a tighter relation between HSBC and uh, uh, potential partners. So it's really looking at how strategically we can create ties and bringing uh, innovation that we couldn't have developed or that 
is out there and that we would like to import inside the company. So it's really a way to uh, re reorganize the company, bringing in uh, new stuff uh, and creating strategic alliance for this investment. Usually we take a seat at the board, so we are, we are there, we are present, we can help the company and they can help us. So it's really uh, uh, creating a partnership, but with an investment. And if you have the investment that proves to be very successful around an idea, uh, at some point it needs the scale uh, of, a, of a bigger HSBC organization. Is there success or failure when you begin to bring those ideas into your mainstream organization? No, because we, we really, uh, when we invest in the company, we usually uh, look for a use case. And we, we look that you see the technology that strategically is important for us. So we're not just going to tactically invest to make money. It really needs to be a strategic investment. So we, we have a, a view that uh, long term, uh, if things go well, it can really develop into something that is material for all the bank, not just for one area, or one department, or one country. So we, we have a bit, we have a, a relatively uh, large, uh, large objective in mind. Okay. Uh, Christy, I'm going to go to, to you next. Um, uh, it's it's, it's uh, not new to the world that mobile technology is changing all industries, which I'm sure your client base uh, indicates. Um, I recently read that mobile payments will be around $90 billion in 2017. My guess is, is that that's low, or it was an old statement, I'm not sure, but it clearly indicates something's happening there big. When you work with your clients to implement your uh, solutions, my guess is that uh, they engage in a conversation with you around how they uh, can, can, can break out into more bolder strategies using your technologies without jeopardizing confidential information. Are there some general themes you can share with the audience? Sure, I, I think the, the enemy of innovation in a lot of these large organizations is security. And so, you know, a lot of times the, we become the mediator between the, the risk, and risk management and risk <laughs> and compliance team and all of the really bright engineers and, and application developers within the organization. So I don't, I don't think they generally start by saying, let's innovate. I think it's usually a, a specific problem, right? We want to do a different relationship with our customer in a retail branch or home health care we want to do. Uh, and there's someone in the company that's saying, no, that's scary to us, we can't do it. Um, and so, you know, we foster the conversation that says, and wh well, what if you could? What if you could trust the data could go on any device? And then what interesting things would, would you do to bring your customers closer to you or to, to sort of uh, revamp your business? So I, I think starting with the question of what, is, what, what do you want? Mm -hmm. You know, staying very focused on what is the the problem you're trying to solve instead of the feature they're asking for is, is, is kind of the core of the conversation. So you work predominantly with large FG, FG 500 type companies, but I also know that you work with smaller ones. Do you, do you get a, a different sense in terms of how these, the size of the organization, uh, their um, excitement or willingness or, or creativity, some of the gentlemen brought up around curiosity, do smaller companies like to push the edge more than Big companies with well, big well, risk I, compliance organizations? Well, that's it, right? So I don't think that the smaller companies want to more than the larger companies do, but I think they probably have an agility that, that is difficult to maintain when you hit a, per, you know, a, a kind of scale. And then you also get you know, kind of the how we do things. So we want to solve the problem. We think the answer is this, but that's not how we do it, so, so we have to kind of approach it a different way. Um, so I. I think that actually what's very fascinating when we go into a lot of these really large organizations is that the bright ideas are already there. Right? They, they oftentimes think they have to go into Silicon mm. Valley or they have to go somewhere and find the smart people. And, and if you have engineers who know your business, they probably already have some really amazing great ideas. Uh, but the how we do things, it's difficult for them to get to the surface. And so you go back to, well, what if you could? What, what if you could trust that it was going to be safer. What if you could get in front of that customer at that point of sale or at that point of transaction, then what would you do? And if you, if you can establish that, then you'll find actually a lot of really interesting uh, ideas are, are actually probably already, are already there. Right. So get them to talk about if you could, don't make the decision. And then if the story's good, then maybe get them to 
we see all the time, I mean, mobile particularly, look, it's, it's a fun spot, and you're, if you have anyone who's writing code, that's what they want to be working on. So they probably already did it. There's probably someone who's already written a hack of an app inside your organization somewhere where they've said, look at this really cool thing we could do, and then, and then somebody went, stop that right now. <laughs> and so they're, they're probably there. <laughs> okay. Um, Jacob, going to go to you, okay? Um, I went onto your website. Uh, Symbio's website, I encourage you to do the same too, cool company. Uh, you focus on uh, co-creating is a word that you use on your website with your clients to find innovative solutions around customer care. So tell us a little bit what, about what you mean by co-creating. Uh, make sure we understand the phrase uh, customer care and then how does your approach really change things of what's the, 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 the normal behavior that occurs in your client base? So our, our concept of innovation co-creation is really around creating a collaborative process that enables you to create breakthrough products and services. So a key focus is really on products and services. Uh, it's actually a process that was derived from the software, software industry, actually where, where we got our start, which was really an R&D process. And now as more and more industries are being transformed and disrupted by technology, essentially what we're advocating is that every industry needs to build this R&D capability. Right? It's no longer about IT or BPO, or it's not about outsourcing. It's really about how do you actually build these co-creative partnerships with, with external partners to actually uh, accelerate uh, the, the, the product innovation cycle. So there are three, uh, there, there are three key principles of our uh, co-creation process. Right? The first is really rapid experimentation. You know, a lot of, I've, I've heard this in the audience about experimentation and, and about uh, you know, uh, disrupting yourself. I think a big part of this actually is you know, a lot of people have great ideas. Right? A lot of organizations have fantastic ideas inside, but as, as what Christy mentioned, a lot of these things end up getting stopped because of uh, you know, whether it be sort of the innovator's curse or innovator's dilemma kind of situation where you know, <laughs> large organizations are so optimized around their existing model that they create these antibodies right, to these new ideas. So a big, big part of this process is really around taking these ideas but rapidly experimenting, right? putting together really fast, high fidelity prototypes that you can actually put into the hands of your end users, your actual real customers. Put that in motion so you can actually quickly validate if these things actually are going to work and then you actually can, can, can learn from that process. I think the second principle really is, is around uh, learning by doing together. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, when you're working with strategic external partners, a big part of that process isn't necessarily specifying what you're trying to get to, right? So if you're, you know, by definition, if you're trying to create something that's a breakthrough product or service, it's very hard to specify what that is. If it was specified, you could do it yourself, right? So the big part of it is starting with the problem, right? Starting with a really clear understanding of what problem or set of problems that you're looking to solve and actually building a process that you can actually learn together with your, with your partner, right, through, through this process, right? So a big part of that is learning by doing together and part of that is the experimentation cycle. And the last principle that we advocate quite a lot is um, what we call sort of metrics-driven experiences, right? So what's changed in the way that you build products and services today versus even just five years ago, um, particularly in Silicon Valley that actually I think is now percolating across every industry, is that you start with the user experience, right? And part of that is actually bringing your end customers, bringing your users into that process. Really, and, and when you talk about user experience, it's not about creating cool things, right? It's not about creating kind of that next glitzy, uh, glamorous thing. It's actually really about what is tying back to those metrics of what is the key problem you're looking to solve, right? So, and testing, right? So continue, when you're doing the experimentation process, putting these experiences, actual prototypes of experiences in front of actual end users and getting feedback and again, learning by doing together. So that, that loop. So one of the things that's uh, I think a mindset change for a lot of companies when we talk about co-creation is it's not a linear process, right? This whole uh, 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 pro concept of building new products and services, it's not linear. It's a learning process and you have to kind of go through lots of iterative cycles uh, to really come up with what is that learning formula in the end. So just to follow up, you mentioned it a little bit. You used the word change. And so whenever you go into a company, you're going to cause change. And typically that change has a strong business case to do it. So from the uh, a business point of view, that change is, is what needs to be done. But uh, like all of us, uh, we get stuck in our routine. Now, some of us don't have routines, and so that's good. But many large organizations that you work for, those people in the workforce have routines, and they don't necessarily want to change. <laughs> yeah. So how do you convince them to, to, to change and get on board and, and 
Yeah. Get on here. Well, you know, we, we usually start a lot of these processes with just a lay of the land of what are the really disruptive forces that are happening in their industries, right? So it's really giving them a lay of the land to understand what's happening at the edges of, of their industry. Because most of the times, these new disruptive technologies or innovations really haven't attacked the core yet. So the adopt technology adoption curve or the absorption curve is still fairly early. So we try to share that with our clients so they understand you know, where they're at and what are some of the competitive threats and risks ahead of them. I think that's the first part of spurring that mindset. I think the second is that we try to catalyze that internal, that, the, the, the internal disruptors. Like, you know, there's, there's so many people inside these large organizations who have fantastic ideas, right, and who probably have better ideas about how to disrupt their own business, except that because of the way that the, the, the organization structure is sort of is formed, they're, they're sort of hired to do specific jobs, right? So we try to catalyze those sort of disruptors. And I think the third is really, again, it's, it's really about experimentation, right? So when people actually start getting into this process of experimenting, you, put, you take their ideas and you transform them into actual prototypes. I mean, oftentimes when we're doing this, it's clickable prototypes, stuff that you can actually go through and start working with your, your end users on. It starts, to, it starts to change that sort of thinking, right? It starts to say, wow, what is the, the, what is the possible? Um, and, and starts getting people focused on the possible and sort of when they start seeing actual progress in terms of you know, validation from these ideas, it just spurs that continual thinking in the organization. Yeah. Now the big challenge is that I think, um, and again this is why I think R&D is a really important discipline that every organization, every industry needs to build, is that it's, not, it's a never ending process, right? So it's not this workshop that you do once, you know, one and you're done, right? This needs to be an ongoing process, right? That an organization starts to build, right? So it's this constant learning, searching, building, uh, experimentation uh, uh, muscle that needs to be built into, in, into organizations. And that's what we try to advocate okay. for. Okay, good. So, Amon. Uh, a while ago, a couple years ago, there was a, some, some public articles around Aramco around the accelerated transformation program that was done. It was labeled, at least what I read, more at the beginning around new business model, uh, changes in behavior, but almost all business transformation activities uh, result in technology-enabled solutions. Uh, and today, a lot of uh, talk around technologies in these so-called exponential technologies. Uh, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, infinite computing. Were any of those involved and discussed uh, towards at the latter end of the program when, when all the hard heavy lifting came to the chief technology officer to, to, to get things done? Well, uh, maybe I can uh, answer that a little bit from just going back a little bit to talk about what is the Accelerated Transformation Program. Um, I'd like to go back to your question, which you asked the audience, and you know, how do you maintain your competitive edge? And you know, I think for us, uh, part of it is being a little bit scared. You know, mm -hmm. I think everybody, leadership especially of companies, has to always be a little bit scared of what's out there. Uh, I like the lay of the land. The lay of the land. You need to keep your mind on what's out there and what's what's going to disrupt your industry and what, uh, where are your real competitive advantage? Where's your real competitive threat? Um, in 2011, when we started our accelerated transformation program. We were at, you know, really a really comfortable position, $100 a barrel of oil, yeah. um, producing our maximum amount of oil, 80 years of a really successful company. Uh, really, at that time, typically companies don't make a change. I mean, when things are going good, you know, don't break it. Uh, that's not what we did. We, uh, our leadership felt at the time uh, that uh, that was actually the best time the best time to make a transformation for the company because we now had the resources to do that. We had the, the, uh, the, uh, maybe the, a little bit more room to maneuver. And so we started the Accelerated Transformation Program, which is really a comprehensive transformation of our processes. And I'd like to go back to that other point about agility. Uh, we as a large company and energy companies in general uh, are very large uh, capital intensive industries with long timelines. So uh, agility is not our specialty. I mean, right. it's not our, uh, our, our core competency. Uh, I think we have to, all companies have to be agile. And if they are not, uh, if they have a challenge in agility uh, due to their size, they have to find other means to complement their, uh, their uh, skills and competency. So part of that transformation program was really to try to bring out that agility to, to improve our processes. You know, I just give a couple of examples, some of the things we did. Uh, we, we realize that our, 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 we really have a great advantage. We have a population, a young population, joining our company. By 2020, 
the majority of our population will be under will, will be millennials basically who will be un, you know uh, born in the 1980s or so uh, and they bring a whole new outlook we actually have an advantage if we can leverage their their knowledge quickly and their capabilities and their uh, their interests and so we established something called the young uh, leaders advisory okay. board and where we bring in, we engage our youth in the, in the, in the company. And that's under 35 for an energy industry, that's young. <laughs> you know, so we, uh, and they, they basically, uh, they, so, you know, they uh, organize themselves. Uh, they have their leaders and their leaders actually participate. Uh, they have uh, very much, uh, they're brought into the table in looking at the issues facing the company. They, they address those issues and they give us really innovative approaches to solving those challenges. Uh, give an example. Uh, we are talking about uh, some of the processes associated with innovation. And our traditional approach to innovation was, you know, uh, basically a software platform which uh, allowed everybody to enter ideas and then we would review those ideas and try to create some, try to identify innovations. Of course, the committees, the review committees, after a few years, lost their interest <laughs> and things just piled up. And so, basically, people lost trust in, in the innovation process of, of the, 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 what they call the open innovation process within the company because we took a traditional engineer's approach. But with the, the Y-Lab approach, it was totally different. They looked at social tools, social networking, and, they, and rather than have committees, they, cho they chose to go for the voting approach where, where uh, the, the community votes the best idea. And they, they really leverage the, the interests of the, of the youth. And we, we actually have a much more agile platform now for, for seeking good ideas from, uh, from our employees. That's just a simple example, but there's many other areas where they've helped us. As part of that whole transformation program, we also realize the importance of R&D. Uh, we have an aspiration to expand beyond our normal business, which is oil and gas. We are moving into the petrochemical industry, and we are looking at uh, engaging with more of our customers. So we have uh, really expanded into many areas where we don't have a competitive advantage as we had in the past. Uh, we have a huge competitive advantage in the oil and gas industry, whether it's our capabilities or our resources. Beyond that, we don't have an advantage, so the only real competitive advantage is technology. And so. Those are the kinds yeah. of technologies you mentioned. Nanotechnologies, we have big, big growth in our research in that area. We have expanded our research footprint. Beginning in 2012, we only had one research center in Dharana, our headquarters. Now we have nine centers around the globe. Uh, we have uh, several in North America, several, one we just opened here in Beijing nearby uh, in April. Uh, and a lot of it is about uh, material science, uh, energy, mostly focused on energy. But uh, we also do a lot of automotive uh, uh, technologies, engine technology, efficiency, uh, carbon management. So there's a lot of interesting technologies we apply, robotics as well. Yeah. Uh, and most of those are those exponential technologies. How do we tap into those exponential technologies and leverage them for our industry? And we, we've already seen really good success in such a, sh a few short years in applying those technologies. I have to ask, at, at, at 40 bucks a barrel, is your investment in exponential technologies increasing or Absolutely. decreasing? Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, it's, uh, you know, it is a tough time, uh, but you know, the, the good news is that we started early. We started actually when we had uh, $100 barrel oil. So we're actually uh, seeing some of the benefits of those technologies now as we speak. So yes, the cost of uh, production is impacted directly by these technologies as we speak. So uh, I, I think we are definitely making some advantage from that. We're much more resilient uh, with that technology than we are okay, without great. it. Good, good, good. I'm going to go back to the audience. Um, we have somebody walking around with a microphone, I do believe. Um, ask your question to the, to the panelists. I have some questions if things get slow, but I really want to engage you and give you the opportunity for your questions. There's a little bit of an up, echo up here at the, uh, at the stage here, so I'd ask you to uh, speak a little bit more slowly and a little bit more loudly than normal, uh, particularly for those that English is not their primary language. Do we have a mic and can we raise your hand? We have a question up here up front, please. Right again. Okay, terrific. There you go. Thank you. Uh, this question is for uh, Jacob and for Ahmad. Um, one of the things I heard you both say uh, implicitly uh, was that innovation really requires companies to have their feet 
in two places at once. On one foot, scaling today's business model. I think the language we used was, um, you, you described antibodies building around certain parts of the business, but there are core parts of the business that companies are gonna wanna keep. And then with the other foot, finding the space to innovate, to be more empathetic, to design unique customer journeys, et cetera. Could you comment a little bit on how you believe companies should go about striking that balance in terms of who should be doing what and how you lead people in terms of where they should be allocating their time? Want to go first? Sure. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that we try to uh, uh, help our clients understand is that you have to think of innovation as a portfolio, right? So it's a portfolio management um, process. Uh, you can think of this as your typical matrix where you have sort of offerings on one axis and you have users on a different axis, right? Existing and new on both axes, right? Most organizations spend a lot of time optimizing their existing offerings for their existing users, right? And I find most, you know, you go, you know, and it's very extreme, right? So you have, uh, you know, you typically go to, let's say, a software company, probably, you know, 90% uh, of the budget is really fit spent on trying to find new offerings for new users uh, versus you go to, let's say, the other extreme, let's say, a uh, uh, you know, a, fi a bank, right, or insurance company where, you know, 90% of the budget is spent on existing offerings for existing users and trying to optimize that. Um, so you have to think about it in terms of a, a, a portfolio of, 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 of innovations, right, in terms of products and services. Um, what we try to do is that we try to help under organizations understand what are the internal capabilities that they have, and oftentimes what most organizations are, are well equipped to do is take uh, whether it be sort of, you know, taking existing offerings <coughs> and users or taking uh, 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 or, 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 or uh, finding sort of new uses for existing business, um, those are things that existing organizations are quite good at. This is what we kind of talk about, incremental innovation. But when you really want to create this breakthrough products and services, new offerings for new users, that's where I'd really talk a lot about trying to find external partners to actually do that together with. Because it's actually very hard to self-disrupt, right? You, you hear a lot about this like self-disruption. I think Clayton Christensen also talked a lot about that in terms of, uh, you know, you have to constantly be challenging yourself. It's actually quite hard to do that in an organization. And I can tell you, whenever companies go through cost cutting, that's the first thing that goes, right? Is, is, is these sort of moonshot things that companies do. And even large tech companies have had a challenge doing that, right? So it's a, you know, it's the, the I, you know, whether it be through an M&A process where you try to acquire or find uh, sort of these breakthroughs, or you try to find, work with external partners to actually co-create that together, um, you know, that's how I'd advocate how do you actually create those break, moonshots or breakthroughs. Um, I'd say that, you know, for, for us, at least, the solutions are uh, a little different. We're a very large company. We're a global. We do have a very large core business. And uh, so uh, our approaches have been different. We looked at uh, how do we get, how do we understand other industries uh, where we're moving into. Uh, one of the areas we looked at are, for example, the venture capital area. The venture capital is a great way of experimenting to understand uh, how, uh, you know, how other industries work first to understand if there's value in that, in that, and is there synergies for your own, can you do it there, can you really, uh, so I think that's a nice experiment, and corporate venture capital is one way of getting into other industries. Uh, most of our use of corporate <coughs> venture capital has been uh, more to accelerate the, the, the kinds of ideas that we would like to apply in our own, in the core businesses. However, we also have, uh, for example, we do some, a lot of venture capital investments now into efficiency, into clean technologies. Um, that's very much a disruptive, uh, if you think of it, for a traditional oil company. But for us, it's, a, it's our long-term view of how we want to see, you know, what are the possible businesses that energy companies should be work at looking at. And uh, we do see renewables as a, as a potential uh, growth area for energy company. Uh, we also look at other possible disruptors, but we, we look at how does it complement our business at the same time that it's a disruptor. So we, we are very much, we want to understand those disruptors as much as we, want to, we don't really want to fight them. We want to see how we can build a business around those disruptors in a way. And that's, uh, that you can do it with venture capital in a way. Uh, you do it with a lot of R&D as well, with you know, traditional R&D internally. So we do a lot of uh, R&D in areas that you would never think we would be working on. Uh, things like uh, hydrogen fuel cells. We do, we do uh, all kinds of interesting technologies that, and then we apply those in our core business uh, so we can accelerate them. But we have a view of potential businesses 
that are complementary uh, to our business later on outside of that. So I think we look for those technologies which we feel uh, or those industries uh, that are still early that might be a complement initially uh, and then may be a big growth area uh, in the future. And that's, uh, that's the way we're, we're looking at it. Uh, as a, but it's very difficult, I have to say, uh, even within internally because of the, the uh, you know, you get this uh, philosophy or uh, a challenge on strategy more than anything else. How does this fit into your business? And especially in times, uh, as we said, where uh, the uh, uh, difficult times financially, uh, it is difficult to make the case. And as a CTO, that's my biggest role is defending our long-term vision uh, on, on research and investment in, in R&D and investment in these uh, uh, disruptors, say. I think that you need also <coughs> to have a, a portfolio of ideas, a portfolio of stuff, but also a portfolio of horizon. I think the time horizon uh, of your portfolio is very important. When difficulties are coming, uh, most companies tend to shorten the time horizon. And so we see it in, uh, in finance, we've seen it in the oil industry probably. Uh, and this shortening this time horizon is really bad for innovation. Um, in finance, I see it uh, very, uh, very acutely. Uh, when I think back in 2007, uh, our time horizon was three to five years. And with the crisis coming, uh, uh, with the regulation, the time horizon of the whole industry has shortened massively. And so its capacity to innovate, its capacity to consider the future, to consider also how the customer is going to evolve and what are its future needs, uh, uh, is massively constrained. And so that keeping a time horizon that is sufficiently long, I think is very important on your portfolio. And I take as an example the Dyson, whose results have come out late last week, an increase of 13% of their PBT. They have a relatively long time horizon and they have a very good portfolio at that. So I think in industries that are prone to shorten the time horizon, sometimes uh, for, regula for regulation or because they are marked to market, so our industry in finance is marked to market, as opposed to the insurance industry, which is still on accrued. Our time horizon has shortened massively, and so we need to compensate extending the time horizon. And this is why sometimes we, we resort to a portfolio of internal initiatives like, like the one that Jacob described, as well as investment into startups, because startups mechanically have a relatively long-term horizon. When an entrepreneur creates something, he doesn't think he's going to, he thinks he's going to change the world, but their time horizon is longer than what we see on a day-to-day -day basis in a, in a bigger company. Anything here? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something maybe a little unpopular, which is we're, we're sort of talking about innovation as though it were a what instead of a how. Right? I, I don't think that you can kind of define a category of stuff and say that's the innovative stuff and that's the non-innovative stuff. And I've been inside companies that have done this really, really well, like Apple, and I've been inside companies that have really, really struggled, like I won't name them because they might be in the room and they might get upset. <laughs> so I, I, I think that, you know, the kiss of death is if you set up a group and say, this is our innovation group, and all the smart people are gonna be there, and all the good ideas are gonna come from those folks, and, you know, whether it's in-house or out, so when we're talking about partnering or we're talking about you know, working with the industry, you're not outsourcing innovation out to them. You're, you're maybe challenging the internal thinking, you're maybe bringing in a different framework to, to look through the problems, but the companies that do this really, really well are not, in, innovation is what you call it in the rearview mirror, it's not what you're calling it at that moment. At that moment, you're solving a problem and you've built a culture where people can think clearly about what is the best way to solve that problem, do I have the flexibility to solve it that way? In what time horizon? Do I have the resources? I mean, but at that moment, you're solving a problem and, and, and a culture that you're building is, is one that is inquisitive and open to new ideas and you know, looks at things from different corners of the building. All of those things are true. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't think innovation is a thing. I think it's a, it's a how. How do you get to the finish line? Do you have the flexibility of thought? Do you, yeah, somebody said earlier when you, when you have the long, the, the moon shots and the budget cu uh, cuts come, those are the things that cut first. If that's true, then that means they weren't developed within the business, right? If it, when we went through a difficult phase, uh, you know, recently in our past and we had to look at uh, restructuring costs, you know, the things that we held on to the tightest were the things that were going to change the business as we went forward. But that's because they were developed in the business. These, we knew these were things that we had to critically get right. 
And so, so there was no way, those were going to be the last things that hit the floor. So a long time ago, there was probably a point in time where those so-called separate skunk works uh, maybe did something right, but clearly life has moved way beyond that. Yeah, and I don't mean that you can't have a lab or a centralized place to think about things, but, but I just think culturally the companies that do this really well make that a hub of a process and a hub of where things come together as opposed to the bucket of really smart things with the really smart people and everybody else is just kind of doing right. A to Z, right? Well, good. I think we had a question up here. Please. Uh, uh, your name and the company and just then again, speak a little slowly and more clearly. My name is Austin Okere from Computer Warehouse Group from Nigeria. Um, also uh, with the with the WEF with, on the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Council. Okay. And my question is to to Christy: uh, Is there a sense of obsession with disruption and innovation? Uh, and I give you a sense of why I'm asking that. I mean, part of why uh, people of my age went for iPhone was that they were stable. Uh, but today, there's so many iOS upgrade, 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 each one, each one with its own mistakes. Uh, are there, is that an obsession? At what point do you say, okay, it's working, let's give people time to enjoy it before, you know, it's uh, my question. Well, so I believe there's a time where you just sort of enjoy it. I think, I think as the consumer, there absolutely is, but I think as... The provider, it's unlikely that you're going to say, okay, I'm good now. I've thought of all the good ideas and I've delivered everything I want to deliver. I think that, um, but is there an obsession with innovation as an abstract concept? I, I, I tend to think there are. I think you mentioned payments before. And when I was inside Citigroup, we were working on pay mobile wallets in like 16 different countries. And, and what was really clear was, you know, we were in the best position to be able to think about mobile commerce. But we had a lot of uh, legacy thinking. We had a lot of regulatory issues. We had a lot of thing, you know, rules that had just built up around the business that were so tight. Google coming in and looking at that problem for the first time has none of those constraints. Right? Apple coming in and thinking about wallets well, at that moment in time, they're not thinking about anything. They're thinking about how do I solve that problem? What does the user experience need to look like so that using a phone to pay for something is easier than a piece of plastic? And, 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 and that's all that's on their mind. Now, will the regulators call them at some point and say, did you think about X, Y, and Z? But I think that's, it's the, it's the how, right? It's it, it, taking yourself out of the day-to-day -day and thinking about the process. And, and in hindsight, you're gonna say, hey, that really worked, customers love that, and someone will write an article at some point that said, they have great vision and amazing innovation culture, but at that moment, you were thinking, how do I let people pay on a phone that, are, that is as easy to use as a piece of plastic? Uh, gentleman in the aisle back here. I'm a lawyer, so I'm used to standing. Um, <laughs> my name is Gary Sieb. I'm with Baker and McKenzie. And um, thank you to the panel for the discussion this morning. There are a couple of aspects that uh, particularly intrigue me. I'm on our um, executive committee, our board, and we're very focused on innovation. But we're focused on innovation in a rather different business model. We're a professional services firm, we're a law firm. And uh, I often say that um, we have 700 partners, therefore we have 800 opinions on everything. And so my question really, I, I really like the idea of the how and the under 35s team. How in a, an organisation which, if you like, is not a corporate organisation, do you drive innovation? What's your, I'm, I'm looking for advice, aren't I? Uh, uh, what, what's your drive? Is it bottom down or is it top up? And, and in that context, the under 35 uh, idea is really attractive to me. So I'd like to hear from the panel on, okay. on driving innovation in a, in a very dynamic kind of uh, flat structure rather than a hierarchical. Christoph, I'm going to have you kick it off, it's OK, because of your role of head of innovation for obviously a very large organization, you've got issues of getting innovation mindset at the top and innovation mindset at the bottom and everywhere in between? I think each, uh, each company is very specific and it depends on their culture and, uh, and the way they, what is their experience, which is the condition they are in and so forth. So um, at HSBC and I think mostly in the financial industry, it's uh, very much a top-led, uh, top-down uh, led effort because again, I think we we need to re-extend 
uh, this time horizon, think longer in terms of the future. What is it that our customers are going to want in three years, in five years? How can we make their life uh, better? How we can advise them better? How can we solve uh, uh, problems of financial inclusion, real problems that the world has? Um, and so to, for that, I think the top is, uh, is extremely important. Commitment from the top is key. And this is why we, <coughs> we have, started, we have um, launched this initiative of, uh, of investing into startups because it's highly visible in the company. And then the mindset of people are starting to change. But obviously, without the people doing the, the stuff changing, um, nothing can happen. So this needs to be taken the relay afterwards, but every layer innovating. Uh, I'm glad that, uh, that with the work that Jacob is doing with HSBC, for example, we were from uh, the, uh, the middle management layer embracing also technology. It needs to be an effort of a collective effort. But uh, in the specific case of financial industry, I think it needs really to come from the top. Okay. Any other comments? Or we go to... I think I? One, one thing that, you know, we're, of course, a hierarchical organization, uh, traditional energy style uh, company. Um, so it is a challenge, you know, because of the silos between organizations uh, to get uh, the kind of innovation to, uh, it may be, uh, you know, one of the things that we have, one, one advantage I think a company like an energy company has is very much an engineering culture, a can-do attitude to solving challenges and problems and a very rigorous approach to solving challenges and, and very technology biased, you know, so, so innovative approaches come naturally to engineers as much as possible. The challenge, the problem is these traditional organizational structures inhibit their innovation. It, it inhibits their ability to implement and to, uh, and it's a risk averse. There's a bit of a risk averseness. So I put a lot of weight on leadership. You know, uh, the only way that these innovations will happen in the organization is if leaders have the courage to make them happen and to have that, to break those boundaries and let those teams collaborate. Because the way these or large, large organizations work is that uh, they're functionally, they do have those antibodies built in. Those antibodies are in what we call our general instructions, our standards. They are there to protect the core business from the risk of innovation in many ways, you know, and uh, that's okay. It's good to have mitigation systems and, and processes. That's good. Uh, the way, that, but you, what you really need to understand is how to get, how to get people to work, collaborate across those boundaries, within those boundaries, uh, and I mean the, but and you have to eliminate all the unnecessary boundaries. So uh, we review our standards. Every, every few years. We have really, really regular approaches where we review our standards because of the recognition that we see those, those standards were put in there. Somebody said, you, you need to coast on your innovation a bit, okay? That's not the way we put those. They should not be there to coast on the innovation, in my opinion. I think you need to keep innovating. You should, those standards are there because they need to protect us from really the most critical dangers, the, the risk, the process risk, for example, in a, in, a, in a refinery, or safety risks. They are not there, they should not be there to inhibit innovation. And I think that's the biggest challenge, is how do you rigorously and systematically review those barriers continuously? And I think the, the choice of leadership is critical at this point because the leaders really have to believe in the value of innovation. Uh, and and they, I, I say, come back to it again, they have to be a little bit scared. They cannot be complacent. They need to have, and the vision part is critical. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people who just, uh, you know, when the times are good, you know, they buy into the vision and, and that's okay. But after, when times get a little tough, uh, then you start hearing, oh, we don't need that. It's, you know, that's just, you know, and the, 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 the knives come out, let's say. You know? I would say uh, that choice of leadership and, is critical uh, so that people really do have long-term vision. They are not short-term, uh, short-termers. And in an industry like where we are in the oil industry, uh, we have the largest reserves in the world. So we're going to be in this industry for the next hundred years probably. Uh, we really do have a long-term vision of what we want to do 50 years from now. And that's real to us. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a, a nice thing to have. We really want to know uh, what are we going to do with oil in 50 years from now? What are, what are the different businesses we're going to be in? What industries we want to be in? Uh, and, and I think all of our leaders have to be that. It's not just the CTO. I do like that phrase, risk of innovation. I've not heard that before. Uh, gentlemen here that's uh, been patiently waiting.
Good morning. Uh, Tim Jones from Artscape in Toronto. Uh, the Schwab Foundation of World Economic Forum has been uh, become a big advocate of corporate social innovation, by which they mean bringing, bringing business interests and social progress closer together. Typically, that's not just in a corporate social responsibility kind of way, but in a way that is actually, in other words, at the margins of what companies do, but in a way that's more central to what companies are about. How much is that on your agenda, and do you approach corporate social innovation differently than you would, say, other types of innovation from within your company? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, we, we do quite a lot of social innovation projects. I mean, actually, even in China, I mean, one of the things that we were very early to do in the fintech space was really try to do a lot of stuff around peer-to-peer -peer lending, social lending, um, actually with the forum as well. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that I think is, you know, also probably related to the last question is that a lot of times this top-down drive towards innovation is sort of one aspect. But, you know, another sort of jujitsu side of this is also just really trying to find serendipity or engi engineering serendipity into an organization. And oftentimes when you do a lot of this social innovation, what you're really doing is you're trying to find interesting new problems to solve that really come from the base of that pyramid. Right? And, and uh, you know, you'd be surprised how much of, how many breakthrough innovations come from these sort of things at the margin, right? Whether it be sort of interesting problems that have emerged in sort of emerging markets. I think GE famously created a portable MRI because of the requirements coming from China. Um, you know, you, you've actually, you know, we've, we've sort of found that, um, you know, a, a lot of times uh, a big part of this is just finding new use cases to, 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 to look for, new use cases to solve for. So again, finding this sort of, uh, from the base of that pyramid, finding interesting new problems that solve that potentially could have transformative effects at sort of the middle and top tiers of that pyramid is where we sort of see a lot of social innovation being very uh, valuable for organizations. Uh, that gentleman here was waiting patiently. Thank you. Anirudh Sharma from Carbon Clean Solutions. You are one of the technology pioneers this year. My question is for Ahmad. We work with, a, um, with quite a number of large companies, especially in the energy industry, and what we see is there are generally two silos. There is an operating silo, and there is an innovation silo. Um, and imagine that you sit in like middle of both. So when you look at innovation, what are the few boxes that you need to tick, and you go to the people at operating side and say, guys, this is old stuff. There is something new. I want you to look at this and probably implement. Yeah, that's that is our biggest challenge. You know, you have the sh the operation, uh, what we call our operation organizations, which are really focused on day to day application and solve solving their problems day to day, uh, and mi risk mitigation. They really don't want to. They they want to keep their operations smooth. They want to continue. And then you have the innovations, which could revolutionize their business and really take them to the next level. Uh, and how do you bring those two together? Is uh, what I was talking about a little earlier about. Uh, and so. Uh, Part of it is really just talking. I mean, we, we have to break those barriers down. We have to get uh, the operation organizations in touch with the innovations uh, and the innovative ideas. They themselves have uh, very many innovative approaches and ideas. Uh, and if you encourage that within those organizations, they, that can be a cultural change. You know, there can be, uh, so we're very much believers in uh, organizational change uh, through cultural behavior. We are, uh, we have a number of, uh, we have a programs that we've established that look at changing our organizational behavior and trying to really focus on the values that we really, uh, that we believe made us most successful. Uh, and uh, some of those are actually the kind of things that, uh, that break down those, uh, those barriers. So co collaboration, uh, empowerment, these are the kind of organizational behaviors that we try to reinforce. And we have actually active, explicit programs to try to, from a top down, bottom up approach, uh, and communities around these behaviors, kind of. Uh, and it, it, we actually, it's a very, very interesting approach. It's an innovative approach to, cha to changing a culture sort of way, or maintaining the, what made us successful, but also looking at uh, and reinforcing some of the things that we would like to see in our culture that could allow us to do more of that uh, innovation that you're, you're referring to. Uh, with operating organizations, it's all about building trust uh, and understanding, you know, really talking their language and understanding what it, their challenges truly are uh, and if they build, if they if they have that trust, they will they will they will work with you. So it, I, I have to say, it's been lazy. I think these silos are created because we've been lazy. In many cases, we don't want to talk. We just want to continue working in our uh, skunk works or whatever, uh, and then we come out with something, 
And of course, you know, if you haven't been talking to your customer, which is your operating organization in this case, uh, they don't want to buy it. It's not something that they need uh, as far as they're concerned. One of the things about a successful uh, a session is when you're out of time and you've got 15 or 20 more questions that want to be asked. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, uh, is wrap up. I'm going to remind you, the audience, uh, what you said at the very beginning. And when I'm doing that, I'm going to go to each of the panelists for your 20-second uh, uh, key takeaway uh, that you heard. Let me tell you what you said. You guys were a great audience today. Without any prompting, here are the things that uh, you brought up around on Innovation Playbook in terms of what are the successful innovative companies do to maintain their competitive advantage. Learn how to learn all the time. Understand your customer. Collaborate across functions, industries, and geographies. Challenge existing business models. Keep track of errors. Create culture of curiosity and creation becomes the norm. Government investment in innovation. Never be content. Show results. Invest in innovation. Be courageous. Don't fear. Pretty good. Jacob, do you mind if I start with you to give you your 30 second closeout? Sure. Uh, I think it's, it still goes back to experimentation. It goes back to sort of finding that serendipity in the organization, having those aha moments. I like that one about finding errors. So oftentimes, find the errors, the non standard deviations inside your organization. Those are the interesting problems that you can start with and build that R&D capability into your organization. Mud? Yeah, I, I, I'd just like to say that I think that the most important thing is really to, uh, to, be, uh, to, be, to be scared a bit, to be looking out there all the time. Uh, and to be, uh, you need to get the excitement, people talking uh, within the, uh, on, on the challenges that are facing you. I do feel that with large organizations, that's a challenge specific maybe to large organizations, that communication is key. You know, the collaboration around the challenges and understanding them and having that clarity is important so that the strategy is People agree and they, they really understand it at a, at a low level, at a really, uh, all the way through the organization. Christoph? Yeah, as, as I said, I think there is a tendency in many of our industries to, to try to, to look too short term. And, uh, and I think there are fundamental challenges in front of us in the world. Uh, and to echo the, the word of, uh, of Raphael uh, Reif, who is the, uh, the president of MIT, I think we need to also create structures uh, for uh, real uh, new ideas on new science, so things which are much more fundamental than some of the incremental innovation we are doing. And to echo the, the, co uh, the corporate social responsibility that, that was there, I think it's really a duty of a number of companies. Christy? I, I guess I'll end with the, you know, innovation is a culture and it's a how, not a what. Um, I think that you know, the companies that do this really, really well, all, all of the other things we touched on, you know, you ne need to have executive sponsorship, you need to have clarity in the problem you're trying to solve and, and stay focused on that particular point. But, but I think the companies that really sort of master this are the ones that leave themselves open to that kind of thinking and incorporate that into their internal culture. And it's not easy. Sometimes you have to bring in new faces and new tools and new partners, but, but, but those are the companies that are able to continuously reinvent themselves. Audience, I want to thank you for being uh, engaged, your good ideas at the very beginning, your good questions, and your attentiveness. Panel, thank you for your commitment to be here, the prep work that you all did, uh, and how you engaged with the audience. Let's give everyone a big hand. Thank you. <laughs>